platypus organizes reading groups, public fora, research, and journalism focus on problems and tasks inherited from the old, new, and post-political left. There's a publication online called the Platypus Review. Um, Platypus hosts events like this, as well as panel discussions and uh, reading groups at various campuses in the city and other cities internationally. Um, So I think most people here are familiar with platypus. Um, Are there any clinicians here? Okay, I like to kind of, I want to gauge like um, the general familiarity with the material of the audience. So um, how many of you guys are familiar with psychoanalysis? Kind of, kind of. Because sometimes I find when I speak to groups of people, like there's not always a, a familiarity with kind of how psychoanalysis differs from psychology or other forms of psychotherapy. Um, do, is this something that would be helpful to kind of speak about? Okay, well, I'll speak about it throughout, but also, I mean, so how many of you are familiar with, with Freud? Sigmund Freud. I mean, there's a general kind of familiarity in the popular consciousness. Um, I'll say maybe as a basic statement, like one thing, I'll talk about some things that make psychoanalysis specific and differentiate it from other forms of uh, clinical psychotherapy. But one thing that maybe you could keep in mind is that, you know, so you go to see the therapist or the clinician because you're having some sort of problem in your life, yeah, and you want to get better, you want to make it better. Well, for psychoanalysis, uh, the clinician knows that the patient wants to get better and also does not want to get better. Uh, so, you know, we can keep that in mind as we go through. Um, so I'll say, uh, just in case, again, I'm Jamie. I teach at the School of Visual Arts. Um, I am not so active in platypus these days, but I've, I became kind of officially a member of platypus in 2010 after I moved to New York. But I was um, kind of marginal at SAIC in the aughts, uh, kind of during the anti-war protests and this kind of uh, moment, like 2006 to 2010. Um, there are a few challenges of putting together this presentation, which thank you for inviting me, David. Um, psychoanalysis and Marxism is a pretty broad topic. And one of the challenges of doing a talk like this for uh, platypus is trying to say something that hasn't already been said very well by other people. Uh, so perhaps some of you are familiar, but there are some resources that already exist um, on Platypus's website and YouTube channel that address psychoanalysis and Marxism, and one of them is a recent uh, teach-in and transcript of a teach-in by um, Stefan Hein and Andreas Wintersberger, and it's called Psychoanalysis and Marxism. Um, so they uh, very nicely kind of um, answer the question of why the left should take an interest in psychoanalysis through chronicling some past engagements of Marxism and psychoanalysis. They talk about Marcuse's interest, they talk about Wilhelm Reich and Adorno's critique of Freudian revisionists, namely um, Eric Fromm and Karen Horney. And then they also bring it into the later 20th century with the critique of Lacanian leftism. Um, Chris Catrone has a 2010 article in the Platypus Review called Adorno and Freud. Uh, where he talks about Adorno's work on Kant and Freud as a critique of the self-contradiction of modern consciousness. So that's worth checking out as well. Um, There's also a teach-in by Viktor Kova from 2021 on the use of, uh, the Marxist use of psychoanalysis to understand fascism, where he talks quite a bit about Wilhelm Reich. Uh, So that's one challenge is like, okay, so there's, there's a lot that's been said about the Marxist analysts and you know uh, so some of this will be repetition but I hope some of it will be new also about how long should I speak that's up to you maybe like aim for I mean, how long do you have okay. I think I have too much material but okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how it goes uh, so um, an interrupt if, if you like another challenge is that the relationship between psychoanalysis and Marxism is most significant for its non-identity or its negativity. In other words, the relationship 
is somewhat tenuous in particular, but that's what we're going to talk about today. And there's a risk of sliding into analogy or comparison, which you may hear me do, uh, which can be productive, but I think maybe um, you encounter conflation of terms. It happens all the time, like the conflation, for example, of the psychoanalytic concept of fetishism with the Marxist concept of commodity fetishism. Yeah, you're laughing, Dio. You <laughs> There's, you know, ma- there are many. Uh, so it helps to delineate. It helps to kind of have some bearings here. Um, also, uh, just in case it, you know, is worth saying, there's no one-to-one relationship between the conditions of possibility for radical transformation in the subject in an analysis and what would be required for emancipatory political transformation on the level of society. So when we do psychoanalysis, we're not doing politics. Politics is the assertion of force over the course of human events. And yet, the question of society bears on the continuing work and development of analysis. There's a dual character to psychoanalysis. It's both of and other than the society that necessitates it. Psychoanalytic theory is based on clinical experiences and new theory emerges from new clinical experiences. And sometimes this results in the positing of new kinds of subjects. Uh, So I think you all are in the reading group, the fall, many of you are in the fall reading group, not all of you. And you guys are reading Marx right now, yes? Okay. Um, So, uh, good. What is Freud's most significant discovery? David? The unconscious, unconscious, yes. Um, Anyone want to go for the second most significant discovery? The origin of psychopathology in infantile sexuality. So these are also two things that differentiate psychoanalysis from other types of clinical psychotherapy. Uh, The unconscious. So, and also we can question whether or not Freud discovered it. We had the idea of the unconscious, kind of drive, impulses, the irrational forces within man before Freud, certainly. However, the Freudian unconscious is specific. Uh, one way in which it's specific is that it's historical, and we can talk more about this. Um, so I mentioned the second most important, the origin of psychopathology and infantile sexuality. So Freud's theory of psychoanalysis uh, stems from this, from the, these two discoveries, his theories of regression, autoerotism, polymorphous perversion, and the drive, uh, all come from this. Um, and are necessary in psychoanalytic clinical work. So if you're looking to get into Freud, um, interpretation of dreams and the three essays on the uh, theory of sexuality would be some important places to start. Um, And also I would recommend don't sleep on the cases. So wolf man, rat man, Dora, young homosexual woman, Schreber. The cases are good in seeing how Freud is kind of constructing and applying his theory. So today, uh, I want to talk about post-Freudian revisionism in the US and what became of psychoanalysis in the later part of the 20th century, including its relationship to the left, to politics and society also more broadly. And this may help situate kind of where we are today. Um, Platypus's kind of taking up of psychoanalysis as an object of investigation, has been a point of some contestation in the past, and for good reason. Kind of also like it's taking up of art, um, has been contentious at different points in time. Uh, We have to be wary of the fact that psychoanalysis does not explain politics. If anything, it's the other way around. Society and politics explain psychoanalysis. So there's two principles that I wanna start with, and these come from a point made by Chris Catrone, in an email correspondence. So after Freud, the Freudian psychoanalytic resources for the critique of subjectivity became divided between treating the ego as a norm, exemplified by Eric Fromm and others, who I will talk about today, and treating it as an illusion or even an obstacle exemplified by the Lacanians. Um, 
if we think dialectically about the ego, the Freudian ego is both and neither a norm and an illusion. And we have to see how this could be the case. Uh, both for, um, I mean, I am talking from the standpoint of being a clinician, but I also, you know, grounding this talk is Adorno, Marx, and Freud. So we have this kind of um, problem of the valorization of the ego versus the valorization of the unconscious, uh, kind of irrational forces versus the force of reason, mastery, and human agency. This um, dilemma, meaning slipping into one side or the other undialectically, is not a new problem. This is a problem of modernism, and it's also a problem dating back to antiquity, although it takes on a kind of renewed and different valence with the emergence and uh, the recognition of freedom in history. So this dilemma is addressed throughout Adorno's work, uh, perhaps most notably in Dialectic of Enlightenment. I'm going to kick us off with some quotes. And one is, so I, I want to talk about, um, before I kind of get into, uh, I'm going to talk about three or four post-Freudian, examples of post-Freudian revisionism in the United States and perhaps France. Uh, but I want to talk first about the dilemma between consciousness and unconsciousness and what Freud is talking about versus consciousness um, kind of from a Marxist perspective, but also more broadly from a modernist philosophical perspective, because throughout his work, Freud is taking pains to differentiate his theory of the psychic apparatus from philosophy, but not from history. So in an 1844 letter to Arnold Bruch for a ruthless critique of everything existing, uh, Marx writes the following of historical consciousness. Our motto must be reform of consciousness, not through dogmas, but through analyzing the mystical consciousness, the consciousness which is unclear to itself, whether it appears in religious or political form. Then it will transpire that the world has long been dreaming of something that it can acquire if only it becomes conscious of it. It will transpire that it is not a matter of drawing a great dividing line between past and future, but of carrying out the thoughts of the past. And finally, it will transpire that mankind begins no new work, but consciously accomplishes its old work. Uh, so here exemplifies, I think, in a quite profound quote, uh, the recognition of the attainment of self-consciousness, specifically humanity's self-consciousness of itself, as historical, as a precondition for emancipatory politics. And... Here, the problem of consciousness kind of in and of history of social consciousness is brought to the fore. <clears throat> I want to also quote a 2008 kind of seminal uh, essay by Chris Catrone called Capital and History. Um, and this is kind of a long quote, but I think it will help kick us off. Uh, so for a Hegelian and Marxian clarification of the specificity of the modern problem of social freedom, it becomes clear that the left must define itself not sociologically, whether in terms of socioeconomic class or a principle of collectivism over individualism, etc., but rather as a matter of consciousness, specifically historical consciousness. For, starting with Marx, it is consciousness of history and historical potential and possibilities, however apparently utopian or obscure, that distinguishes the left from the right, not the struggle against oppression which the modern right also claims. The right does not represent the past, but rather the foreclosing of possibilities in the present. For this reason, it is important for us to recognize the potential and fact of regression that the possibilities for the left in theory and practice have suffered as a result of the abandonment of historical consciousness in favor of the immediacies of struggles against oppression. So the abandonment of consciousness and here we have a concept of consciousness as involving mediation as opposed to immediate immediacies of struggles. Um, he continues, what would it mean to treat the entire Marxian project as first and foremost, a recognition of the history of modernity to court as one of the pathology of transition from the class society that emerged with the agricultural revolution uh, 10,000 years ago and the civilizations based on an essentially peasant way of life through the emergence of the commodity form of social mediation 
to the present global civilization dominated by capital towards a form of humanity that might lie beyond this. With Marx, we are faced with a self-consciousness of an obscure and mysterious historical task, which can only be further clarified theoretically through transformative practice, the practice of proletarian socialism. But this task has been abandoned in favor of what are essentially capital reconstituting struggles, attempting to cope with the vicissitudes of the dynamics of modern history. And he ends this essay with an urgent call for an acute awareness of our moment in order to assess uh, the most salient uh, possibilities or lack thereof, right? So in other words, there's a forgetting of the possibility of the kind of epochal uh, transition that was recognized um, by Marx, but also uh, you know, in philosophies and theories of modernism, uh, you know, this, is, this is lost. And this is aligned with the concept of historical regression uh, of the Frankfurt School, and namely Adorno. So Catron is writing this in 2008, okay? He's like, it's urgent. We have to recognize that things are getting worse, right? Things are bad. There's this complete lack of self-consciousness of, uh, you know, the nature of humanity as historical and therefore mutable. And um, 2008. So things have gotten worse since then. I was surprised to see that protest outside. Um, have any of you guys seen any anti-war protests on your campuses? Yeah? Okay. I'm a little, I'm a little out of touch, but I, I really haven't seen much activity around this. I just like, it, it feels very, we're in a weird moment. Um, that's one way to describe it. But so in addition to the question of consciousness and unconsciousness, I want to add a dialectic of optimism and pessimism. So both Adorno and Catron are notorious for their seeming pessimism, which is at worst taken as some kind of curmudgeonly attitude as opposed to a critical position. Uh, but insofar as it is a critical position, it's optimistic. Um, so in other words, Adorno is more optimistic than E.G. Heidegger, who tends to read as more comforting. Um, so Adorno is refusing to reify categories that are in tension with each other, such that their self-overcoming might yet occur. It's the recognition of the possibility for uh, something else, that something else is possible. Uh, hi. So that something else is possible is an essential tenet for both Marxism and psychoanalysis, um, which are also predicated on the fact of cause and effect, that some things are caused by other things and that such relationships are knowable. Uh, this um, quote attributed to Roman playwright Terence, nothing human is alien to me. Yes, this should apply to the Marxist and to the analyst so, in other words, the world should not become unrecognizable to the Marxist or to the analyst. Um, we must be fully in the world, though perhaps not fully of it. And I, so, with this in mind, I want to say a little bit more about consciousness and subjectivity. It, in... Um, a book called Discovery of the Mind, which was published in 1953, a classical philologist named Bruno Snell, looked at the development of Greek literature starting with Homer, and he chronicled the development of archaic Greek, well, starting in archaic Greece, he chronicled the development of um, an experience of subjectivity in antiquity. So the evolution of a rational view of the nature of man as a thinking being. This is uh, an account of the discovery of human activity as driven by a mind with agency as opposed to directed by disparate forces of innate unconscious compulsion or intervention of the gods. Uh, there was a time before internal conflict. That, that's the consequence of this investigation. There was a time before internal conflict. There was a time when a mind divided against itself was unthinkable or unexperienceable. Um, in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, there's this line by Freud that I think about a lot. He says, and this is published in 1920, he says, 
if there is a beyond the pleasure principle, it is only consistent to grant that there was also a time before the purpose of dreams was the fulfillment of wishes. Um, so Freud makes this claim in the context of the individual, but it's not entirely clear that he's not making reference to the species as well. And also throughout his work, there is a kind of ontogeny, phylogeny um, uh, relationship uh, where he's, all, he's often looking at the history of an individual um, in relation to the history of the species. And sometimes he gets in trouble for it, uh, but this is kind of Freud's approach to thinking um, the psyche as historical. Uh, so um, I'm going to skip over this particular point. But uh, just an additional note about kind of the historical specificity of the experience of the self or subjectivity. Um, you know, I think other kind of historians of ideas or philosophers have approached this. Um, I am an art historian, so uh, there's, a, there's a book, it's kind of a fun book by William Manchester called A World Lit Only by Fire. And in it, he talks about how in large swaths of the world during what he unapologetically calls the Dark Ages, um, most people have no ego. They don't even have a last name. They, like, you know, live in the same place uh, for, you know, their entire lives. Um, so he really paints a picture of the kind of egoless um, medieval kind of European peasant. Um, and, and also this is paired with a kind of lack of sense of time, like no calendars, um, right? At the years go by, they're the same. There's a cycle. Uh, and this relates also to, uh, you know, something that I think is commonly read in an introductory reading group, this Louis Menon piece, uh, which distinguishes the pre-modern from the modern world in similar terms. Um, also, I think of uh, John D'Amelio's critique of the, or appeal to the gay rights movement in the 80s, where he, um, he critiques this reading of personal experience back onto the past. So all of this is in support of a kind of um, historical, historical specificity to um, the experience of being a thinking uh, being. <laughs> so, or we could say subjectivity broadly. So I wanna talk about the specific nature of the Freudian unconscious especially given that the idea of a mind divided against itself isn't new. So what is new about the Freudian unconscious? Um, and in order to approach this, I'm gonna cite a 1924 short essay called The Loss of Reality and Neurosis and Psychosis, uh, in which he um, makes a distinction between the structural evidence for neurosis versus psychosis and uh, the clinic, in the clinic of psychoanalysis. So both neurosis and psychosis involve a withdrawal of reality. In neurosis, a drive impulse is repressed in the service of reality. But there's a compensation for the repressed drive in the form of the symptom. And this means that the repression didn't function well enough. It's also a reaction against the repression and failure. So it's reaction against and failure of the repression, the neurotic symptom. In psychosis, reality is relinquished, right? So as opposed to the drive, the repression of drive impulse and psychosis, reality is relinquished in favor of the drive, uh, but reality can't be repressed. So hence, uh, Freud's concept of foreclosure, verwerfung. So psychosis is uh, to some degree, evidenced by an absence of repression. Disavowal of reality can function in neurosis and psychosis. Um, hallucinations can function in neurosis and psychosis. Uh, but this is, a very, this is an essential point, and I'm saying it to you because this supports the, Freud, the concept of the Freudian unconscious. Um, and we're going to see some divergences from this, how it becomes compromised in revisionist theories. So, um, yeah, in Adorno, Marx, and there's a little bit more here about kind of clinical application of Freud, but maybe we get to that later. I don't think it's so essential to go through it right now. Um, Adorno, Marx, and Freud all share the idea, uh, perhaps we can attribute it to enlightenment 
uh, ideology that the irrational could be rationally understood. Um, the Frankfurt School takes up Marxism as a uh, critical methodology as opposed to a theoretical basis for revolutionary politics. They do this out of necessity, right? Because there's an absence of international revolutionary politics. So this is attributed, this absence is attributed to historical regression. The regression of the possibility for emancipatory politics on an international scale. So um, the Frankfurt School takes up Marxism as dial dialectical critique, as method. And uh, the idea is to apply this method to the present, as opposed to dogmatically fitting present conditions into predetermined forms thought to be present in Marxist theory. So this differentiates the Frankfurt School's imminent dialectical critique from other forms of um, kind of Marxist politics, uh, broadly speaking. In 1926, Adorno's habilitation shift, which was ultimately rejected, is called the concept of the unconscious in the transcendental theory of mind. And in this piece, Adorno thinks that Freud might be able to supplement some or fill in some gaps in the Kantian uh, theory of transcendental subjectivity. Uh, this, and he bases this on Freud's introductory lectures of 1916 to 17. Uh, in the, uh, Susan Buckmorse's Origin of Negative Dialectics, she makes a claim that Adorno uses Freudian and Marxist concepts together such that they take on new meanings. I think we can uh, you know, contest this, but there's also something to it because Adorno is thinking about Freud all the time. Freud is everywhere in Adorno's work. And uh, he's also thinking about Marx all the time, but he's referencing Freud and Freudian concepts all the time. And he's critical of post-Freudian revisionists, particularly ego psychology, uh, but he's not a clinician. And he doesn't think that he's a clinician, right? He's, he's not doing psychology. He's critiquing psychology. And he's critical of Freud, too, right? He's constantly thinking about Freud, and at times he, he has very incisive critiques of Freud, as he does with most of his biggest inspirations. Um, so I'm going to refer to Stefan and Andreas' piece. They say, for Adorno, the potential of psychoanalysis and Marxism could only grow out of their non-identity. The desire to force upon them a synthesis in order to liquidate their differences, according to Adorno, was reconciliation through blackmail. They continue, in revised psychoanalysis, the tension between individual and society was simply severed theoretically. The two stand opposite each other as unmediated antipodes. Maybe the most important lesson Adorno took from Marxism and its failure was that if concepts like subject and object, man and world, mankind and history, proletariat and capitalism, party and class belong together, it was only in their non-identity. Because if one were to change the other and therefore both were to mutually change themselves, they must be differentiated but held in relation and not ontologically eternalized as separate. So these dualities being held in tension, productive tension potentially, right, dialectically um, leading to some uh, transformation as opposed to falling one way or the other into either side. And this is, uh, again, kind of setting up um, what I'm going to talk about as an approach to the ego and the self in the 20th century in American psychoanalysis. So Freud's... Um, a famous Vo Esvar Sol Ich Verden, where it was, their I shall become. Sometimes translated as where it was, their ego shall be. But their I shall become is a better translation. So for Freud, I, I quote this section of Stefan and Andres' piece because for Freud, uh, conscious and unconscious are not contradictions, but mutually constitutive of psychical experience. So they're not in contradiction, but there is conflict, which is why someone goes to speak to an analyst. Uh, so um, I have a bit on the Freudian drive, um, and particularly as he kind of delineates it in the three essays on sexuality, but I think maybe we can save that for the sake of time. Uh, 
But I do want to refer back to D'Amelio again because Freud, like D'Amelio, distinguishes sexual activity from sexual identity. He doesn't use the word identity. Freud says object choice. And uh, so he has in the three essays this kind of object and aim, object, object, aim, and drive are kind of the three constituent parts of you know what occurs. And um, he has a nice, he has a lot of good footnotes. When you read Freud, you have to pay attention to the footnotes because he goes back and he like reads his work and he revises it based on new discoveries. And he has a really great footnote in the three essays where he says, um, "The ancients honored the instinct, while we prioritize the object and despise the instinct." And in the three essays, you can find kind of Freud's more radical thinking about sexuality, constitutive bisexuality, polymorphous perversion. Um, but you can also, you know, hear him say various like misogynistic things or kind of static, let's say static and rigid um, conceptualization, deterministic thinking. Depends on what you look for. Overall, Freud is for satisfaction, right? Uh, so Freud on femininity, which we can return to if we like. Let's talk about post-Freud. Uh, so like the left, psychoanalysis, it has all sorts of kind of, it has a kind of cult-like character. There are many schisms, there are many disputes. Uh, unlike the left, at the height of the crisis of psychoanalysis in the United States, in the 60s and 70s, but also leading into the 80s, uh, there was not the same flight into the institutions as e.g. the new leftists who kind of fled into uh, the university and civil society institutions like nonprofits and NGOs. Chris Catron talks about this in a um, president's report from 2013 uh, on the 1980s. Um, so in the 1980s in the United States, the closure of psychiatric hospitals around the country it's a kind of conservative deinstitutionalization. Um, could also be said to contribute to the deinstitutionalization of psychoanalysts and also other mental health clinicians who then went into private practice or to work for hospitals. So instead of the psychiatric institutions, people in need of um, you know, treatment, inpatient treatment, uh, or long-term, more intensive treatment, um, were given the alternatives of psychiatric drugs, hospitals, home care workers, or jails and prisons. And that's kind of where we are today. And particularly, um, you know, in New York, there are many clinicians in private practice. So uh, the departure of psychoanalysis from the institutions is a significant moment. Um, to set up, I'm gonna talk about three psychoanalysts that practice in America. Otto Fenichel, Heinz Hartmann, and Heinz Koha. Uh, but first I want to refer to Freud's visit to Clark University in 1909. So, uh, and this account comes from Sherry Turkle in a book called, um, I think it's Political Psychoanalysis from the late 70s. And she's mostly talking about uh, psychoanalysis in French, but, or in France rather, but she talks about how when Freud comes to the US, um, you know, he famously is like uh, skeptical of America and he says, we're bringing them the plague, right? You can see it in that movie, A Dangerous Method, or he's um, played by Viggo Mortensen. I don't know if you've seen it, it's kind of, I like it, I recommend it, it's Cronenberg. Uh, so he goes to Clark University. He, he gives a talk about his psychoanalysis and it turns out that everybody's pretty, everyone likes it. Psychoanalysis is well received in the United States. Freud didn't have a very good time here. He kind of went upstate on some hikes. Uh, he did, I learned, see a porcupine and he really liked this. That was the highlight of his trip. He liked to see the porcupine. Um, but so, so psychoanalysis was kind of warmly received in the United States. People are interested. And Freud is suspicious of this. He's like, there should be more resistance. <laughs> He's like, why do they like this so much? Is it because they're diluting it? Is, there, is it because they're getting it wrong? Um, there was resistance to psychoanalysis, to Freud's psychoanalysis in France. Um, it was seen as too didactic stylistically. It was seen as uh, an affront to morality, as Freud would expect, right? This is, he gets this criticism his entire life. 
the rejection of psychoanalysis in the United States, or sorry, the reception, that was a slip, the reception of psychoanalysis in the United States is critiqued on several grounds, and by reception I mean how psychoanalysis is received and flourished uh, in the early 20th century. So there's re rejection of lay analysis, meaning the training of non-clinicians, and insistence on medical qualifications for practitioners. So this was loosened in the 1940s. Um, and so today, if, you're, if you don't have a clinical background, but you have an academic background or a background in the arts, so you can go train at an institute. Uh, but even as early as 10 years ago, there was only two institutes in New York that trained so-called lay analysts. Now there are um, many. So uh, Freud was surprised at the warm reception of psychoanalysis in the United States. Um, the Second World War was, um, had a major impact on the distribution of psychoanalysis on a global scale and also on psychoanalysis in the United States. So I'm going to talk about Otto Fenichel. He's a second generation Freudian. Uh, he, his years are 1897 to 1946. He, he, his life is cut short. Um, but in the 80s, there was an archival discovery of some secret newsletters that Fetishel uh, circulated, organized, uh, 100 something letters written during his exile um, from his exile from Germany, or from, the, from Europe rather. He comes to the United States as many European analysts do. Um, so he's from 1934 to 1945, he's circulating these secret newsletters. And it's him and other Marxist socialist analysts. Many of these analysts trained in Berlin in the 1920s. Many of them came from Vienna, but also other parts of Europe. Annie Reich, uh, whose husband is Wilhelm Reich, and Edith Jacobson were other members of this group. So the newsletter was about psychoanalytic practice, but also socialism and Marxism. And secret newsletters of small groups of analysts was actually a, a thing that people did. Um, but uh, Fenichel instructed recipients to burn them afterwards. So that's why they were not really discovered until more recently. And this was the basis for Russell Jacoby's book, The Repression of Psychoanalysis, which he says is not a biography of Fenichel, but it kind of is. So in 1922, Fenichel moves from Vienna to Berlin to train at the Berlin Institute, which was founded by uh, Max Edington and Ernst Simmel in 1920. Simmel's a socialist. Later, he's in California with other people affiliated with the Frankfurt School, and he organizes uh, in California, later on, a conference on anti-Semitism as a social disease, which uh, hosted Fenichel, Horkheimer, and Adorno, and others. So the Berlin Institute was seen as more rebellious than Vienna. It's Freud's in Vienna, so if you're in Vienna and you're a psychoanalyst, you are you know, loyal to Freud. You have to work under the master. Um, in Berlin, you have uh, you know, Fenichel, as I mentioned, but also Klein, Franz Alexander, Karen Horney, other analysts who departed from Freud. In Vienna, you have Heinz Hartmann, Ernst Kriss. Uh, Wilhelm Reich moved from Vienna to Berlin as well and started hanging out with Fenichel. Hartmann and Kriss will go on to be major um, players in ego psychology in the United States. In 1924, uh, Fenichel reads, or, sorry, leads a seminar um, which uh, is controversial because of its socialist politics, its political character, even though in Berlin it's a bit more uh, lefty. And uh, it's called the Children's Seminar because they're being like rebellion, rebellious children. Um, so Fromm, Eric Fromm, and Wilhelm Reich depart from Freud in different ways, which you can read about in those other essays that I mentioned. Uh, we can talk about it too, perhaps. But Fenichel remains committed to Freud. He wants to further Freudian psychoanalysis. And in 1945, he publishes the Psychoanalytic Theory of Neurosis, which is a giant book, very detailed account of Freud's theory of neurosis. It's like an encyclopedia. Fenichel is very uh, detailed. It's, um, it becomes a very important text. He wants to protect Freudian psychoanalysis and Marxist politics. So he maintains a critique of any psychoanalysis that slides into either deterministic biologism, 
or purely cultural, social, ethnographic explanation for character formation. So this is another instance of wanting to keep uh, you know, these two aspects in tension, not kind of collapsing in one way or the other. Uh, he's also worried that the Frankfurt School in California will turn Marxism into a simple critique of technology. And he particularly is critical of Horkheimer's lecture on the individual and mass culture. And this is also his critique of Eric Fromm, who was involved in the Frankfurt School, but also kind of became a controversial figure. Um, but he believed that Fromm thought the helplessness and powerlessness of individuals derived from machines and technology itself, per se, and not its kind of capitalist use and application. Uh, I'll just go through Heinz Hartman and Kohut, um, if that's okay, if you guys are still with me, good. Um, Heinz Hartman is Viennese. He grows up in a secular bourgeois family. His paternal grandfather is a writer and deputy to the Frankfurt Assembly of 1848. His father is a historian of Rome and a professor at the University of Vienna. And he serves as Austria's ambassador to Berlin after World War I. His maternal grandfather is a reputable doctor admired by Freud. And his childhood tutor, Karl Seitz, later became the social democratic mayor of Vienna. He's a student of Max Weber's at the University of Vienna. So Hartmann has a good thing going. And uh, he encounters psychoanalysis in Berlin in the 1920s. He does a training analysis with the Hungarian analyst, San Sandor Rado, uh, who also analyzed Wilhelm Reich. And afterwards, back in Vienna, Freud wants him to stay. Freud likes Hartmann. He wants him to stay and undertake a free training analysis with Freud under the condition that he remains. Uh, ultimately, like other Viennese analysts, Hartmann's got to get out. Um, in 1937, he publishes a book called Ego Psychology and the Problem of Adaptation. Hartmann wants to integrate psychoanalytic theory with a general psychology and a general theory of mental life. So in other words, take psychoanalytic concepts into the realm of general psychology. And he also... Uh, reduces, in order to do this, the psychoanalytic emphasis on inner conflict, the mind divided against itself, by positing the ego's autonomy. Uh, two aspects of Hartmann's theory, the ego's conflict-free sphere, to which the uh, analyst is meant to appeal, and also the ego's capacity for adaptation, both of which are essential collaborators in the project of acquiring ego strength. Okay, so this is where ego strength is coming from, not necessarily Freud. Uh, although Hartman is interested in Freud, he's training, he's got an analysis with Freud. He also remains aligned with Weber, and he wants to extend psychoanalysis contribution to sociology. Uh, like Weber, he bemoans all theorization of the mind as the adversary of the soul. And in an essay on Hartman by A. Stuart Hughes, he says, Hughes says, uh, or he quotes, he quotes, sorry, Hartman, the tendency of psychoanalysis to enlighten must of necessity relativize the rationalistic doctrine of enlightenment. So Hartman felt that the claims of enlightenment needed to be tailored to the moment. And this is how he does this by the general psychology, autonomous ego, conflict-free zone. With Ernst Chris and Rudolf Lowenstein, the latter of whom is uh, Lacan's analyst in Paris, pioneers ego psychology in the US. So he moves in 1941, becomes involved with New York Psychoanalytic, which was the major institute at the time in New York, and in the 19, by 1950, he's president of the International Psychoanalytic Association. So Hartman is a major figure in American psychoanalysis and an analysis of Freud. And we can maybe talk more about ego psychology in this vein if we need, but this is, um, uh, it, it does mark a radical departure from Freud in that it initiates a departure from the unconscious and the origin of psychopathology and infantile sexuality. Okay, so then moving even further from those tenets is Heinz Kohut. Uh, Kohut is raised as an only child in a Jewish family in Vienna. In the late 1930s, he flees Europe as a refugee and ultimately ends up in Chicago in 1940. Uh, his application for admission to train with the Chicago Institute was initially rejected, but he kept trying. He find, found his way in in 1960s. 
he's established, he's influential in Chicago and beyond. And in the 60s, he's adhering to the Freudian drive theory and technique, which means, in the United States already, ego psychology. Uh, in the 1960s, American psychoanalysis is losing credibility. Membership in the American psychoanalytic is falling, and the average age of members is rising. There's a rise of the new left counterculture and political radicalism in the late 1960s, and this comes with it, brings with it a skepticism of psychoanalysis, a critique on the basis of feminism. Uh, and in Chicago, there's the 1968 DNC. Uh, Democratic National Convention, protests, demonstrations, uh, 10,000 protesters clashed with the police in Grant Park, um, Mayor Daley leads an aggressive police response, and this is largely the anti-Vietnam protests. Um, so anti-war activism coupled with campus organizing, sexual emancipation, the feminist movement, uh, you know, ego psychology, which is the predominant, and note that ego psychology is ego psychology and not ego psychoanalysis. This is something to, to keep in mind. It appeals to maturity, accountability, and responsibility equated with, um, I mean, acceptance of traditional gender roles. Like, there really were conservative mid-century analysts who were, like, uh, if they had, like, a woman patient who, you know, only wanted to have sex on top, they, they would, like, think that she's too phallic and that this needs to be correct. There, there really was a conservatism um, you know, homophobia, misogyny, of course. So this was happening, and people were, you know, suffering from it. And it starts to kind of enter uh, the general critique of psychoanalysis, which, you know, already has some, you know, people have difficulty accepting some of these controversial ideas of Freud's. So, uh, you know, Bruno, Bettelheim, Bruno Bettelheim is a popular Freudian analyst in Chicago, and he kind of condemns the anti-Vietnam anti War activism as edible acting out. And then there's the new left counterculture, radicalism, anti-authoritarianism, to which Kohut appeals. He is going to radically change his kind of orthodox, classical, ego-psychological Freudian practice. And also his son was an anti-war activist and went to Oberlin. Uh, but... Also, during the Cold War, some well-known ego psychologists are complicit with McCarthyism. <clears throat> so there's, again, a real conservatism. Uh, at the same time, psychoanalysis sets the stage for sexual emancipation and the cult of the individual, or the cult of the self, as chronicled in the Adam Curtis documentary, Century of the Self. So by the 70s, um, Kohut is proposing something that feels more adequate to this new outlook. And one of the things, so also at this time, there's an increased psychoanalytic interest in pathological narcissism. So there is a representative of like a kind of com combination of ego psychology and object relations in um, uh, Kernberg, Otto Kernberg, also Viennese comes to the United States. And he's theorizing pathological narcissism in terms of a more classical Freudianism. Kohut develops what he calls self-psychology. So Kohut um, essentially theorizes the self as a discrete entity. Um, and this is a way for psychoanalysts who are having difficulty dealing with these patients who they consider pathological narcissists, like maybe more difficult to work with than what they consider to be a classical neurotic. Uh, Kohut devises a theory which makes it easier for the analyst to have a bit more compassion because essentially all of the narcissistic pathology and all of the patients become narcissistic in self-psychology. Uh, all of the pathology is attributable to early childhood failures of what Kohut calls the self-object, which is the caregiver um, and so the analyst's job is then to be optimally responsive on the basis of empathy and understanding in order to provide the corrective emotional experience. So no longer are we doing work with the unconscious interpretation of, you know, the content of slips and dreams, free association in order to think um, about how something might be more than it appears 
as in Freudian psychoanalysis, now we have something much more direct, which is essentially a reparenting. Um, I mean, Kohut's not stupid, right? He's, he's smart, he's educated, and his um, method appeals to people who are getting real frustrated with the kind of silent uh, analyst, right? The archetypal, kind of stereotypical, cold, rejecting ego psychological analyst. Which, by the way, I actually went to um, recently a talk where an analyst said that by the 1920s, Freud's jaw cancer actually was pretty bad. And this, at this time, he had mostly American sick, uh, analysis. And so they got like a silent Freud, whereas Freud used to kind of talk to his patients and maybe mix it up a little bit. So this, I mean, I think this is very interesting. It's, it attributes this. Uh, or rather the kind of um, convention of the silent analyst to this potential experience of the American uh, analyst with Freud. So just quickly, um, I mean, there's much to say, but uh, in the US, there's ego psychology. In the UK, there's object relations. Also, South America, we get some refugees as well from Europe, so some object relations, some ego psychology, but in Europe, elsewhere, and in South America, there's Lacan. So Lacan's so-called return to Freud is addressing a bias against Freud and against psychoanalysis in French psychiatry. Uh, I mentioned before how you know the psychoanalysis was um, more tentatively received in France, is there's more resistance. So Lacan really was addressing, right? Lacan was doing a kind of return to Freud, and he's um, uh, speaking to clinicians, he's giving case uh, presentations, and he's also doing his seminars. Um, he's anti institutional, so he's kind of a renegade, and this also. Um, is appealing to some clinicians and also, as we know, kind of intellectuals and philosophers in France. So um, Lacan or Lacanian theory arrives late in the US. Uh, and it arrives via the new left and academic institutions. So elsewhere, Lacanian psychoanalysis is kind of transmitted as a clinical practice. In the United States, it's taken up by like Post-structuralist theory, deconstruction, linguistics, literary theory, okay? And so the clinical application of Lacanian theory in psychoanalytic technique is something different than the academic application of Lacanian terminology in e.g. cultural studies. Uh, there's more to say about this, um, but maybe I feel like I should end and open up the conversation. Uh, because again, there's there's way more we can we can say, but I wonder if there are questions or other thoughts. <clears throat> yes. I guess I have a question. Um, is you talked about how there's a difference between whether there's like a non like people want to make analogies between psychoanalysis and other areas, or there's like. Like a lot of the people you mentioned, like Adorno, for example, like they weren't clinicians, mm -hmm. and they weren't you know, practicing analysts, but they used, you know, like secular like, concepts and sort of used to talk about things. Or like a lot of people who are popular on the left today, like for example, Zizek, like, they're not practicing clinicians. And so, so it's like, can, I know, like, like, what are they doing? Or how do you feel? Like, what are they doing when they use these like Freudian concepts? Or how do you like? How do you like? How sh how do you think about it when like people you know, are using like the you know, in in academia to like talk about I don't know, like culture? These kinds of things. Like, are they talking about something that's like genuinely psychological or psychoanalytic in like what they're talking about, or is it like because I hear from other people that's like these concepts only make sense in the in analysis, like in the treatment room. And we'll just take it outside of that and apply it to like, I don't know, like mass crowd behavior or mm. something, then it's something really different. So just, I'll just wonder about that. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So first I'll say that you know Freud does write about mass psychology in uh, group psychology and analysis of the ego. So he's also he he is interested in groups and in particular 
the function of identification. Um, so Adorno's interest in psychoanalysis and Freud and in psychology in general can be treated negatively, meaning, I mean, you know, he, he takes up Freud and Freudian concepts and applies them to a critical analysis of society, such as, like, um, identification with the aggressor, which is Anna Freud, um, or reaction formation, uh, right? So he uses some of these concepts and applies them to social critique, and often it is, like, again, juxtaposed to other kind of sociological or political Marxist categories, and this uh, is Ador one way that Adorno kind of constructs his, um, you know, imminent dialectical critique. So the, the psychoanalysis and the um, psychology is forms a part of the understanding of bourgeois subjectivity, right? Freud's object is a bourgeois subject. It's historically specific. So I could say that for Adorno. For other, you know, for contemporary critical theory, Shishak, other like kind of Lacanians, I mean, I think this again goes to a kind of conflation of Marxist and psychoanalytic categories in a way that is kind of, let's say, positive, meaning taken up positively. So that like a concept like, you know, maybe you hear something like surplus jouissance, uh, right, as a like related to surplus value, but actually this doesn't have anything to do with Marx's concept of surplus value because surplus jouissance emphasizes surplus and surplus value emphasizes value. So, okay, your question is what are they, what are they doing? Um, I mean, again, I think that the Keynesian theory is a bit uh, seductive to postmodernism because you know, Freud and Marx and Adorno are writing to be understood. They're writing to construct a coherent critique, a coherent project, uh, in the case of Freud and Marx. Um, so a Lacan is, as you said, speaking to clinicians, uh, and he's... Um, I've heard, I heard something recently from someone, it would be interesting if this is true, because you know, um, Lacan has his uh, ecrise, this is the published writing, but most of Lacan's works are these seminars. And um, not all of them are translated into English right now, but they are from the notes in memory of attendees. So they're compiled from those notes and some of Lacan's own notes in certain cases. Uh, and the thing that this person said was that he, Lacan is speaking like an analysand might speak in a session because he's speaking to clinicians and so it's about learning how to read and interpret a text in this way. And I think because of the form of it, uh, this is seductive to, um, you know, more perhaps semiotic or post-structuralist, post-modern um, uh, forms of theoretical investigation. Uh, so, like, when you, if you read Lacan, and I, I do agree with Catron, like, go for the top shelf, go read Freud. But if you read Lacan, like, you can, uh, you, you will read it opportunistically. It's the only way to read it. You know, you have to decide what you're going to take out of it. And the best way is to read it opportunistically as a clinician, I think. So, that doesn't fully answer a question as to what they're doing. Yeah, I was, I was just curious about this question because it seems like I've heard this before people talk about how, like, you know, like, Freud has these categories and they're, like, meant to, like, treat patients and he wouldn't call a patient narcissistic when he would use these phrases, like, I don't know, like, reaction information is going to, like, you know, been in the clinic for a long time with a patient, that kind of thing. And now these other people, these, like, intellectuals are coming in and, like, swooping in and taking these things that are supposed to be used for clinic and applying them to like society and maybe it doesn't fit or like was, yeah, just kind of like something that happens much about that kind of thing. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that that's true. <laughs> that's true. That happens all the time. The question is whether or not it fits, whether or not it, it forms a part of a kind of salient and productive critique and uh, engagement with our moment, which I think Adorno does. I mean, they're also, you know, Adorno's interested in 
uh, more uh, like an application of psychoanalytic concepts in the basis of society, right? So like social critique. socialism as a kind of late Marxist intellectual. Um, but what, um, yeah, what do you find, like, what do you find interesting about the, the crisis of American psychoanalysis, and how is it a repetition of these, like, this earlier crisis? Um, and maybe also, I, I guess, like, to maybe another interesting point here is what you raised about, like, the kind of appeal of mass psychology in the, in the 60s. I, I suppose this is a dynamic that Freud's also dealing with, and it, you raise this as well in his like, group, um, group psychology studies, but this is also like part of the politics of fascism. Um, 
but also going back to Marx as part of the politics of like mm. bon- Bonapartism. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm just okay, curious. There's a lot there. <laughs> there's a lot there. There's yeah. a lot there to, to respond to. But it gives me an opportunity to just foreground the kind of pro- or highlight the problem with Hartman's ego psychology or the kind of conflict free zone of the ego, the ego as autonomous, right? Because I mean, the question of like autonomy, self determination, agency, and mastery, I mean, these are kind of necessary questions that any type of like critique of society or emancipatory politics would take up, um, you know, dialectically. But the uh, the autonomous ego, in term, it, it's, it's a radical departure from Freud for a simple reason, because for Freud, the ego and the id and the superego are not separate psychical spheres. They're um, mutually determining. They're they they're they can mutually constitutive, right, of human subjectivity, human experience. So the ego is a specially differentiated part of the id. The ego is not, for Freud, uh, you know, present in the subject. It does have to be formed. So um, maybe to address, I mean, and I have a little bit of an allergy to um, kind of, you know, the, the question of, like, uh, is the party a superego, right, this is why, because I'm like, "Eh," you know, like, okay, task master or something, like, or guilty or whatever, but, like, um, let me see if I can articulate it better, Uh, yeah, I have an allergy of that type of application, you know, society is not a patient, and um, imminent dialectical critique, the Frankfurt School's Marxism, is developed for a particular object, which is uh, the crisis and self-contradiction of bourgeois society, right? So there's not a, a correlation there. Um, but you were talking about Adorno's essay on sociology and psychology um, in this particular case. So Adorno does have this, I mean, uh, repeated, oh, also in terms of the you said like the, the rep- repeated crisis in the 20th century development of, I would say regression or departure, right? It's, it's, um, it is a departure from Freud. And to some degree, I mean, you know, we could analyze the reasons for this. I, I, I brought up some, some having to do with the demands of the patient. Um, there are kind of new theories of psychological types. I tend to question this. For example, the emergence, right, the kind of Lashian culture of narcissism. I mean, he's talking about narcissism not necessarily syndromatically, but culturally. But he's using Kohut. He's using this moment of the 70s, and like all of a sudden there are all these narcissists. I don't think so. I think that it is the case, as Freud recognized and others after him, that uh, kind of popularity and knowledge of psychoanalytic theory will change the manifestations of neurosis and psychosis. Um, but I don't necessarily, I'm, I'm skeptical of kind of new pathologies in this way on a broad scale. So uh, there were other parts of your question. I was gonna just maybe try to speak to this issue of like the, the if an ego even could, right? So in the problem of a new type of human being and elsewhere in his work, there is this, like we can't even have an ego these days and also the replacement of the father by society creates a structure of domination such that, yes. So this is one way that Adorno uses uh, Freudian theory to construct an image of social regression. And I mean, it's, for me, it's, it's, a, it, um, it's a real problem, right? It's a real problem because there is not going to be, uh, I mean, these are the subjects we're working with and we can't count ourselves apart from this critique if we're going to take it up, right? That's the eminence. So, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not, I think it's a great question, but I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer it otherwise. Any parts I missed? Uh, no, it was, it was kind of vaguely posed, so I apologize for that, but I'm sure we can come I thought it was clear, just many parts, mm-hmm. multifaceted. I have a two, one part's like, I think, a legitimate question, but the other part is 
just some of you referenced multiple times that I found so, that I find so fascinating, and I hope uh, I stepped out, so maybe you did speak on them, but I hope you could speak on them more. Is Wilhelm Reich, and I feel like he touches on a lot of the elements as like a, a pre-Lacanian psychoanalyst who is attempting to do some of this stuff that we're like having questions about, and just mm. like, but also is so off the wall. So maybe if you could speak a little bit about what you think of Reich in a general sense, uh, and like his maybe literal exploding of the clinic into the world itself, like thinking you could psychoanalytically treat the clouds or something mm -hmm. <laughs> to uh, uh, treat mass psychology. Um, <clears throat> and then also just on that point in general, what it seems like many of these people are trying to take these psychoanalytic terms and apply them to politics. What value or what historical examples are there of people attempting to take the advancements in Marxism or leftist thought into the clinic, like does that have any... Okay, yeah. good. Your questions are related because the primary example would be Wilhelm Reich. Yeah. And the reason I didn't talk about him is because he's been spoken about quite a bit mm -hmm. um, and is read in the syllabus. But yeah, he is, you know, explicitly Marxist and writes, takes up uh, Freudian um, group psychology in, uh, in you know, theorizing mass psychology, in particular social contradictions. So he applies like psychoanalytic um, theory as a critique of, um, I mean, I don't know, I think of, I think it's in um, ideology as a material force, where he talks about like, well, you know, these analysts who are prioritizing like social adaptation are trying to find out why people are stealing, like why there's these examples of degeneracy, but really the question, the psychoanalytic question is why aren't more people stealing? Like more people could just go take the stuff, right? So it's about like the question of, um, yeah, structure of society. Uh, Reich is not at the top of my mind, but he is an interesting kind of figure among Marxist psychoanalysts. And he was tight with uh, Fenichel, who I mentioned, who also had, they ran in the same circles. Uh, Annie Reich, Wilhelm Reich's wife, was tight with Fenichel. And so these are kind of the, what Russell Jacoby calls the political psychoanalysts. They're explicitly socialist, they're explicitly Marxist, and they are interested in a social psychoanalysis um, Jacoby's argument is that, you know, this is all going great in Berlin and then a little bit in Vienna when they go there, but then during the Second World War, um, you know, they, many European clinicians come to the United States and they find that they need to um, mute or dampen their revolutionary politics, um, both because of the threat of fascism but also in order to assimilate um, this has been critiqued. Jacoby's been critiqued for this, so I'm not sure because, you know, Fenichel, for example, you know, a uh, critique would be, well, actually, you know, by the time he comes to the U.S., he's, he's actually not that um, interested in kind of creating a, a synthesis of socialist politics and psychoanalysis. And also, actually, I said synthesis, but they were not necessarily, Fenichel didn't want to synthesize. Fenichel wanted to do Marxist politics, socialism, and psychoanalysis. It's not that he thought they were completely disparate and you know, no connections whatsoever, but he was conscientious of the kind of different spheres of activity and what was required differently. I just didn't know if you had any takes on organ therapy. Oh yeah, 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 right, right, right. No, 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 right. That's um, yeah, because he kind of was harnessing his heart, harnessing sexual energy. So he really took up, you know, other post Freudian analysts are critiqued for like doing away with the sexuality, but right, because like goes in the opposite direction. So I mean, I, I, you know, poor Wilhelm, because they really got him in the end. But maybe you guys have seen or heard this Kate Bush song cloud busting yeah the music video so that's my answer to refer you to a fun okay. music video uh, I think that's the best manifestation she read Reich's son's um, memoir and wrote that song great song but I don't think we can use sexual energy to manipulate the clouds if that's what you're asking 
I have a question. I'm not sure I can word it very well, but um, I guess in Freud's theory, to some extent, society is the source of repression of, of desires. Mm. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, like, with these different uh, psychoanalysts over the 20th century, um, to what extent is, through the, is there the idea that um, maybe, like, uh, um, sort of therapy can only go so far given society as it is, or like the, the potential of therapy is conditioned on the, uh, the specific situation in society. Yeah. I'm wondering if like the postmodernist sort of psychoanalysts kind of abandon maybe the idea that, well, they, they, they essentially sort of ignore the idea that maybe society has to change um, to allow, say, like the ego to constitute itself better, as, mm. as mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, and there's a couple of things that I'll speak to there. Uh, to the latter part about whether, like, giving up the idea that society should change, I think there are many instances across various psychoanalytic tendencies that would pathologize uh, an experience of the wish for society to change, as opposed to the individual coming to terms with some sorts of changes in the self. There's a lot of, uh, I mean, we could characterize this as conservative, we could also say that maybe in some instances it's true, <laughs> like maybe this is right, based on the individual. But broadly speaking, I think that that idea does characterize, um, I mean, I think you could find it in Freud, but also post Freudians. Like again, when we're talking about Freud, you can find like instances of kind of static conventional thinking and you can find, uh, he, he wrote so much. There's like so much of his work and so you can find really radical thinking as well. Um, in terms of the idea that society needs to change so that the ego can reconstitute itself, I think this is very particularly a Dornos thing. Um, but for the question of postmodern psychoanalysis, which I will just say Lacan, right? Because there's Koha does postmodern psychoanalysis as well. But for Lacan, I mean, I think Andreas and um, Stefan posed a really good question in their piece, which is like, okay, so uh, they, they question the concept of the barred subject or split subjectivity, which is complex and we could talk about it for a long time. Um, you know, the, the question of this subject is not necessarily always meaning subject as in experience of self, but their question is, you know, so for Lacanian psychoanalysis, uh, the subject is necessarily split based on the fact that, um, based on the fact of language, but also based on the fact that there is an other. Uh, and this then goes through a various, uh, ideally various, um, I'm trying to find the precise terminology, but you know, is for Lacan the edible dynamic specific to the bourgeois nuclear family, right? That would be the question. Uh, I'm probably not posing it as eloquently as Stefan and, um, and Andreas, but you know, I think another way of putting the question is, is any subject that we can imagine that has language the same kind of subject for Lacanian psychoanalysis? So a slave in ancient Mesopotamia or an alien on another planet that has language and speaks to another person, are they the same kind of subject? I think this is a question that is begged by this theory. Um, but I think that there also are in more, so, um, you know, I, I think that uh, we could probably find answers to it if we were to be opportunistic again in our reading and research. Um, any other questions? How are you guys feeling? I have a question. This could be for the room. Um, or Jamie, you can jump in too. But like, I, I just noticed that like on the left, there's a lot of people who have turned to psychoanalysis to try to make sense of uh, social changes that have occurred specifically over the past 10 years. And this is just really different from like before, like maybe even five years ago. Um, Maybe the change happened in 2017 very slowly. Um, But yeah, like when I was younger and when I first encountered Platypus and was getting involved in the left, um, yeah, I think 
it's not that there wasn't people talking about psychoanalysis, but it was a kind of marginal phenomenon. Whereas, like when we did the like when we did the the club fair here, um, there was like ton, like dozens of people who were like, oh, Marxism, Lacan, and psychoanalysis, and they and a lot of young people who have been participating in a very online left and a, and a left that's been very focused on a lot of like demos, mass demos, direct action in like the 2020 period, these protests um, for like Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, um, but also anti-Trump protests before that, um, who were kind of politically indoctrinated in a lot of internet Maoism, uh, have in their undergraduate years become interested in the canyonism because it seems to be like a explanation for a standstill that they find themselves in. And I don't know like I don't know if you guys have like interest in psychoanalysis, if this sounds like something you have encountered. Like maybe a more basic question would be like what like are you guys interested in this relationship between Marxism and psychoanalysis and why? And like does it, what I'm describing seem familiar to you or is that like an alien thing? Is that just something that's happening on my campus, you know? <laughs> Um. I also have a, a, like a question from that, mm -hmm. which I think is related, and maybe there is a, a more like historical answer. <clears throat> you mentioned like Freud and a lot of these analysts; they're from a bourgeois background, and are analyze their, their subject is the, the the object that they're studying is the bourgeois subject. But it seems like psychoanalysis is not the um, it's not what insurance pays for. It's not the mm. psychotherapy of the average bourgeois clientele, or at least it's not like what's promoted or, or sold or, or things like that. It's not, if the desire was to create more bourgeois subjects, that's not what contemporary psychology is doing. You know, maybe like CBT or the, for the lower end applied behavioral analysis or something is more popular. Yeah, I'm glad you asked this question because it gives me the opportunity to make sure that the distinction between bourgeois subjectivity in an epochal sense and then bourgeois in a class sense is clear because Freud, you know, this, this is a way of saying that the Freudian unconscious and the possibility for psychoanalysis as a clinical practice with therapeutic effect arises in history, in bourgeois society specifically. So that, you know, uh, my kind of brief chronicle of like archaic and ancient and medieval subjectivity as distinctly different in ways that is difficult to imagine, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's specific, right? So like even the particular forms of suffering, the neurosis and the psychosis are specific to bourgeois subjectivity. Um, but yeah, this problem of like the, what, what kind of um, clinical approach is deemed uh, in, um, worthy of compensation by insurance companies, uh, I mean, it speaks to the um, tenuous status of psychoanalysis in the United States, despite, the, I mean, this is a kind of contradiction, despite the fact that, you know, there was this kind of, uh, there were these um, rigid criteria for clinicians to become a part of the medical establishment, and for a period of time in the mid-20th century, psychiatry was psychoanalytic in the United States, but uh, through some of these critiques and the um, you know various discreditings, I mean there have been many vocal critics of psychoanalysis and Freud in particular, um, and and I think this moment of deinstitutionalization in the 80s and kind of the rise of um, pharmacology as a go-to treatment, right? There's just it's about efficacy, um, so there's there's much we can speak about there, but in terms, David, of your uh, noticing that like there is this increased interest in Marxism and psychoanalysis in particular Marxism and Lacan I mean I will refer back to this um, you know the fact that Lacan arrives late in the United States and arrives through academia and not clinical practice and I mean there's still like his work is still being translated and released in English like so more and more of this content is coming out. And the people I imagine who are professors now were kind of, you know, there, there is this primacy of the postmodern, post-structural critical theory, I think, in many academic programs. Um, you know, like you can't do 
there's a particular way that the institutions, that you have to do history. Like, you can't really have this kind of um, modernist history which applies, like, judgments and makes claims on the basis of anything other than... I, I, I don't know, I could go on and ramble about it, but um, I also think it's an interesting question because, like, I noticed that... Well, I think I said at the beginning, like, this interest in platypus. And I think there's also an interest in, like, organizing a panel about Lacanian left. So I was very surprised to see this um, come up in, in platypus. So, yeah, I would be also curious to hear others kind of answer David's question. On psychoanalysis and Marxism in, on campus or in general. I know when I first uh, encountered Platypus, I w literally I walked up to Aaron, the current president, and I said, "Oh, Marxism like Zizek," and I do think. And she she was like, she told me something about the left being dead, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I do think on campus generally there is like um, this very close association between like the project of uh, psychoanalysis and Marxism, like through Zizek. Uh, people usually share the two interests. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, like, in my thinking about psychoanalysis um, is this question of, like, this critical capacity. Like, um, the, one of the big critiques you might hear of psychoanalysis is that it encourages people to adapt to whatever condition society is in. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, like, I'm curious about, like, how through psychoanalysis alone you might be able to distinguish, like, what would be like reasonable circumstances or reasonable discontents that people have with society uh, that aren't like merely pathological? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question. I will speak to it a little bit because I think that we should be careful not to, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but not to attribute too much to psychoanalysis in terms of the possibilities for recognizing uh, regressive or reactionary elements in society. Uh, for the very reason you mentioned. I mean, in other words, a simple way of saying this is not to idealize psychoanalysis. Um, the kind of, I mean, uh, psychoanalysis is, the therapeutic effect of psychoanalysis should be always more freedom, not less for the patient. It should be towards uh, radical transformation. But radical transformation in a clinical sense need not mean a complete transformation. It means like, uh, okay, someone comes to a, speak to an analyst because they wake up every morning and have anxiety. And then after you know several months of speaking to the analyst, they no longer have anxiety when they wake up in the morning. And like, maybe there's another problem. There's like a different problem, you know? So, so it's something like this, which seems on the face of it very simple, but actually is like a very pr profound and significant change in uh, experience. In terms of the question of, or a critique of psychoanalysis as facilitating adaptation to bad conditions, I think we see this throughout Adorno, and it's a salient critique. This is also Lacan's critique of ego psychology. And I think that any kind of critical application of psychoanalytic theory or any critique of psychoanalysis should be on the lookout for um, questions of adaptation, you know, meaning reconciliation to what currently exists and whether or not it would lead to uh, you know getting the patient to be happier to live right like this sort of thing very simple right so it doesn't even need to be like um, I mean I think there's a particular use for the uh, idea of like a change in condition such that um, an ego can be constituted. But the clinical stakes are different. And that's why Marxists should also be suspicious of psychoanalysts and why Platypus should be uh, suspicious of psychoanalysis. <laughs> Does this answer your question? I think for the most part. Mm. Yeah. I think something that... Uh, one of the things that I think people like Zizek are the calm for, and I think one of the examples of the kind of analogic slippage that you mentioned in your, in your talk that will occur is there'll be like discussion of symptoms 
um, a global society. I think like Zizek has that essay on like Freud and Marx and, and the fetish. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think in like one of the earlier coffee breaks um, this semester, I, like a student who is studying psychoanalysis, like or psychology and wants to become a psychoanalysis, um, she was asking about like what is that dif- like what is the difference between um, like a, for- a Freudian fetish and, and the f- fetish fetishism commodities. Um, and I just kind of like rudimentarily gave like a textbook answer of like, well, like the fetish and Freud is like a replacement um, psychically, whereas fetish and like Marx, like the commodity fetish is like more of the anthropological category of fetish of like, uh, like the spiritual totem around which society is kind of structured. Um, and so it's, uh, it is a kind of like category error to conflate the two, although like the appeal is understandable. <laughs> um, but I don't know, like I don't know what your thoughts are on that answer. Like this, I actually happen to have a lot of thoughts on the conflation of the fetish. <laughs> um, I, I think that fetishism has been over theorized in psychoanalysis and in like uh, you know other cultural kind of critical spheres. But um, the, yes, so the fetish for Freud is a substitution. Um, the, oh, I'm losing my train of thought. Um, so the, both uses of the term share the anthropological root. For Marx, his famous um, section on the commodity fetish in Capital, volume one, He's actually using it in a kind of ironic sense. So, in other words, it's a critique of the of bourgeois um, kind of subjectivity to critically understand its own categories, right? So there's there's this kind of ironic component to it, uh, but it's often taken up to mean, in the psychoanalytic sense, a kind of overvaluation of something like a you know an item that you would purchase, right? So greed or something beyond need and like the you know consumerism. I mean, this is an unsophisticated, uh, you know, unsophisticated take, but I think it's not entirely strawmanning to say that it's used in this way, which, which is an example of the risk of conflating them. You know, for Freud, the fetish is a solution to a problem. It's a, it's a problem rooted in infantile sexuality, and that is the problem of, the, of castration, but particularly the maternal phallus, which is there or not there. The fetish is, I mean, Freud compares the fetish to a creative act. Uh, For Marx, commodity fetishism, and there's a good essay about this by two Greek Marxists on commodity fetishism and capital fetishism. Freud uses commodity fetishism to set up his later kind of um, culmination in volume three of, of capital fetishism. And uh, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm losing my train of thought, but but essentially, um, yeah, there's much more that could be said about it. So what, um, yeah, what would be the relationship between commodity fetishism and capital fetishism? I haven't read volume three, full disclosure. Okay, um. no, no, I mean, look, we need not brush home to read volume three. But so so for Freud, I actually happen to have it written down. And since it's getting late, I would like to read this to you. So for, for Freud, the fetish is the exemplary perversion. Um, and there's more that could be said about this. But the fetish character of the commodity is the exemplary expression of value in capitalism. And what is value? It's a quality. Social relations between people of which the commodity is an expression take on the quality of relations between things. And this is not only a matter of the object's use value being overtaken by value that is created and appears as a natural quality of the thing. Also, commodities in capitalist society have a dual character. As a use value, the commodity is a particular thing. As a value, the commodity is the quintessential objectification of abstract labor. Because the commodity can't function in both senses simultaneously, the general character of the commodity is externalized in money as a universal equivalent. Mm. 
This means that money as such is not the problem. So again, another conflation, right? Money as such is not the problem. Uh, it may be the root of all evil, but it's not the root of unfreedom and capital. Neither is the commodity form in itself the problem, but rather it's a manifestation of the crisis of bourgeois social relations in conflict with the industrial forces of production and capitalism. This leads to the capital fetishism. The fetish character of capital masks the essence of capitalist society as something distinct from its appearance and hence as something mutable, meaning this mutability is masked through the capital fetishism. So commodity fetishism uh, is not necessarily problematic per se, but... Yeah, it's an expression. Right. It expresses the crisis. It expresses the problematic. Yeah, and I mean, look, the same actually is true for psychoanalytic fetishism. It's not, it's rarely the complaint. It's not a problem, it's a solution. Um, yeah. I was wondering, was psychoanalysis, like, when did psychoanalysis become popular, say, like, in the broad middle class, like, at what point in the 20th century did that happen? Well, Freud was successful in his day, like, there, um, you know, so Freud is, starts as a neurologist, right, in a hospital, and he's um, trying to figure out why there are, he's working with hysterics, hysterical neurosis. Um, and the idea, the assumption is that there's an organic cause, like there's a physiological cause, and yet, you know, he's interested in the work of Charcot, who's hypnotizing, using hypnosis to cure hysterical symptoms, conversion symptoms, right? So it's the repressed that uh, manifests as a bodily symptom. Which still, people think like hysteria is gone, but it's not. Uh, but that's an aside. Um, so, so, so Freud is like, wants to find an alternative to some of these kind of in like backwards treatments of psychopathology, right? That he's like, they're doing all sorts of crazy stuff like pulling people's teeth, put them in ice baths, there's the rest cure, which is popular, which essentially means that if you're going crazy, you have to like lay in bed alone and not think about anything or do anything, which is drives people more crazy. So uh, Freud, you know, tries, he's like, wants to try hypnosis, but it turns out he's not very good at it. Uh, so instead, he and his colleague Breuer start like inviting people to speak, and it turns out there's some resolution in the symptom. This is going beyond the question that you asked, but that's just to say that like people were suffering, and Freud, uh, Freud's invention of the talking cure uh, was a um, welcome alternative to the other types of treatments for um, you know. A, psychopathology that doesn't seem to have an organic cause. So, but it, you know, it's also um, maybe take some time to get off the ground, but, but there's, a, there's a, a desire, there's a need for it. Yeah, and that's helpful. The reason I was asking, which I maybe should have mentioned already, was um, I guess I was trying to think about sort of historically how this sort of preference for Marx via Zizek or Marx via Lacan has happened versus Marx by Adorno, say, mm -hmm. or just Marx, I think, that further. Because I guess, like, psychoanalysis sort of becomes, like, a need in society with sort of the expansion of the middle class, maybe in the early 20th century. Um, mm. I, don't, I don't know if you'd agree with that. I mean, I, I, like, in the... You know, Mar Marx is, like, dealing with the proletariat as, like, the revolutionary subject. Um, I'm not really trying to analyze it sort of psychologically in, in, in that sort of way. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm wondering, like, if there's, like, one possible answer for the reason why sort of Marxism via Zizek is more popular is, like, the left is dead and there's, like, a lack of a socialist party which would sort of make um, Marxism, more, more orthodox Marxism, sort of would, would help to make the case for why that's important. Um, so, but that would be something that would have occurred, like, say, from the 30s or so onwards, like the defeat of the socialist movement, mm. defeat of the inter international socialist movement, whereas, like, the sort of rise of psychoanalysis um, as a field, I was thinking, would be a little bit earlier with, like, with Freud, say, 1910s onwards. That's right. I mean, that's, that's right. Um, the wars, but particularly the Second World War, does provide, uh, does disrupt 
the development of psychoanalysis. Uh, and but in particular, you know, it, it um, one consequence is the kind of flourishing and development of psychoanalysis in the United States and the UK. Um, but you know, in terms of the question of kind of who seeks analysis in history, which I read in your question, um, I think this also speaks to maybe your earlier question about uh, like. There is a tradition of analysts providing free treatment or low fee treatment. I mean, also, analysts definitely um, treat like neurotic, rich people. <laughs> Marie, Princess Marie Bonaparte was one of Freud's, Freud's most famous patients. Um, you know, Wolfman, the first analysis, is quite wealthy. So, so uh, yeah. So that's just to say that they're also. Um, it's, it's common for analysts to do like slide and scale or to keep some spots for insurance, you know, because there can be reimbursement in this sort of thing. Uh, but I, I don't know, it's a, it's a tricky question, you know, because I feel like your question is about, um, you know, whether or not the kind of appeal of psychoanalysis, like whether or not people feel compelled to seek and speak to an analyst is connected to political consciousness. Um, and, you know, we, there is this thing which is sometimes referred to as Freudo-Marxism that takes different forms in the 20th century. And I think you're right that like people are not necessarily looking to Adorno for Marx. Um, does this have something to do with the theory itself or does this have something to do with what's available in the academic institutions? Does this have to do with some sort of resistance? I don't know. These are good questions. <laughs> <laughs>